I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The word advocate, the word comforter means helper. It, it, it literally has the idea of a helping presence, a divine helping presence. So here's Jesus talking, and Jesus says, I will send you an advocate, a comforter, a divine helper. He is coming to help you. But I will send you the advocate, the spirit of truth. He will come to you from the Father, and he will testify all about me. Would you pray with me today? Father, I feel so inadequate this morning to discuss the person of the Holy Spirit. I'm so grateful that when you left, you did not leave us alone. Even though you ascended to your Father, you, you did not abandon us. No, you gave us a divine helper. You gave us a divine comforter, a divine guide. God, the Holy Spirit, who resides in each and every one of us today. Well, Lord, I pray that you'd help us to understand him. Father, help each and every one of us to realize that if we're followers of Jesus Christ, that he is living inside of us. Oh God, help us not to ignore him. Lord, how, how shameful to have the Holy Spirit of God living within us, and yet we live day in and day out at times without recognizing his presence, without being submissive to his direction, without taking advantage of all that you have made available to us. And so, Lord, this morning I pray that you'd help us to meet the Holy Spirit. Help us to realize today that he is our greatest need. And Father, if we can tap into, as it were, his presence, and his power in our life. Father, we can experience victory. More victory than we can imagine. We can experience joy. More joy than we could imagine. We can experience satisfaction. More satisfaction than we could ever imagine. Help us not only to believe in the Holy Spirit, but I pray that you'd help us to relate with him today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I'm gonna give you a couple of introductory statements that are in your notes. The first is this, and it might sound simplistic, but the Holy Spirit is not a ghost to be feared, but a person with whom we should have a relationship. Now, now I know, especially if you grew up like I did, reading the King James Bible, the term Holy Ghost is found over and over again more than 90 times in the King James Bible. And designating him as a ghost has led many to arrive at erroneous conclusions. The Holy Spirit of God is, is not a phantom. The Holy Spirit of God is not an apparition. The Holy Spirit of God is not spooky. He's not just a force as if you know, Luke Skywalker would look at you today and say, may the force be with you. If we're not careful, that's the way that we view the Holy Spirit of God. But he's not a ghost to be feared. The Holy Spirit is a person with whom we should have a relationship. As you study the person of the Holy Spirit throughout the Bible, he possesses all of the characteristics 
of personality, the same as God the Father and God the Son. And just as God the Father relates to you and God the Son relates to you, so God the Holy Spirit desires to have a personal relationship with you and me. The second thing that I wrote down is this. The Holy Spirit is not a resource to be used. Let me pause there for a second because so many people today view the Holy Spirit as if he was a spiritual divine vending machine. And so they go to the Holy Spirit whenever they have a need and they put in a dollar and say, well, today this is what I want and today this is what I want. As if he was a vending, she, uh, a vending machine that was simply given to us by God to give us everything that we want. That's not why God gave us the Holy Spirit, so that all of our wants would be met. He's not a resource to be used, but he is the sovereign God who should be worshipped and obeyed. Throughout Scripture, he is described over and over again with attributes of deity. In Hebrews, he's described as the eternal spirit. David describes him in Psalm 139 as being omnipresent. He's everywhere at the same time. Job describes him in Job 33 as being omnipotent. He had creative power. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 that he is omniscient, for the Spirit searches out everything and shows us God's deep secrets. No, the Holy Spirit is God Almighty who deserves my worship and your worship and my obedience and your obedience. And yet I would also say today that the Holy Spirit is the most misunderstood. The Holy Spirit is the most neglected person of the Trinity. Often, and we should, we speak of God the Father, and often, and we should, we speak of Jesus Christ, because by the way, the Holy Spirit's job is to point us to Jesus. He never talks about himself. He always talks about Jesus Christ, and so we understand that. Yet because of that, if we're not careful, we view him almost as a secondary member of the Trinity. We understand, or, or we misunderstand him, and not only do we misunderstand him, but I am so afraid that many believers ignore nor his presence in your life. As we'll see in just a few moments, he lives in you, he lives in me. Francis Chan recently wrote a book titled The Forgotten God, speaking of the Holy Spirit. And Francis Chan contends that we have ignored the Holy Spirit for way too long. He makes this statement. I'll put it up on the screen. He says, While no evangelical would deny his existence, I am willing to bet that there are millions of churchgoers across America who cannot confidently say that they have experienced his presence or his action in their lives over the past year. What an awesome statement! What a tragic statement. So let me ask you this morning, how is your relationship with the Holy Spirit of God? Are you aware of his presence in your life? Are you dependent upon his power? Is he guiding and directing your life? That's why God gave him to you. That's why God gave him to me. I want to see three simple points. I say they're simple points. They're deep and profound, but I want us to see them this morning, even though there's other points that we could bring out about the Holy Spirit. And if you're interested in this topic, I'm sure as we go through our You Grow doctrinal classes, that at some point we'll teach a class on pneumatology, which is the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. But today, I want to bring out three points that I trust will be an encouragement to you and a blessing to you and a conviction to you, because I promise they have been to me this week. The first thing we see is this, the Holy Spirit convicts. The Holy Spirit convicts. Uh, would you go back with me to the book of John? And uh, now we're in John chapter 16, the very next chapter. We read uh, chapter 15, verse 26. But, but notice beginning in verse 5, John chapter 16 and verse 5, Jesus says this, 
but I am going away to the one who sent me. And not one of you is asking where I'm going. Instead, you grieve because of what I've told you. But in fact, it is best for you that I go away. Because if I don't, the advocate, same word that was in 15 and verse 26, the advocate won't come. And if I do go away, then I will send him to you. Verse 8, and when he comes, he will convict the world of its sin and of God's righteousness and of coming judgment. The world's sin is that it uh, it refuses to believe in me. Righteousness is available because I go to my Father and you will see me no more. Judgment will come because the ruler of this world has already been judged. You'll remember, if you're familiar with the Gospel of John, that John chapter 16 is part of Jesus' upper room discourse. He's there meeting with the disciples in the upper room hours before he is arrested, tried, convicted, and crucified. And there in the upper room, he shares with the disciples and with us through Scripture his most intimate thoughts. He spends much time talking about his replacement, the advocate that we have already mentioned in our initial passage. And here John chapter 16 gives us additional information as to the responsibilities of the advocate that Jesus has sent for us. Notice Jesus says, first of all, that his responsibility is to convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. The word convict, I'm not sure how it's translated in your Bible, but the word convict has the idea of reproving. It has the idea of rebuking or even convincing. I love this. One author said that, that the Holy Spirit convinced the world, convinces the world of the fact of sin, the fault of sin, the folly of sin, and the filth of sin. That's the Holy Spirit's job. His job is to convict us of sin. By the way, let me pause there for a second. I didn't plan on saying this, but man, to receive and to feel the conviction of the Holy Spirit of God is a wonderful thing. You say, Brian, what are you talking about? Man, when I'm convicted, it makes me feel miserable. You ever feel that way? You ever do something and then, man, the conviction of the Holy Spirit just comes all over you? Somebody said that once you're saved, you still sin. You just don't enjoy it near as much as you used to. And the reason we don't enjoy it near as much as we used to is because God has placed the Holy Spirit of God within us. And his job is to convict us whenever we do wrong. It's his job in a loving, fatherly, compassionate way to tell us, uh, 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 (laughs) that's not how you as a believer should be acting. He convicts the world of sin. If I asked you today, what is man's greatest sin? I'm sure that I would receive, man, just a a multitude of answers. I find it interesting because as, as Jesus goes through and he kind of fleshes out what that means, he says he will convict the world of sin, and then he goes further and he describes exactly what that means. Notice what he says in verse 9. He said, the world's sin is that it refuses to believe in me. As I read that, I thought, man, if I would have been Jesus, I would have talked about a different sin. I would have said, man, you know, the world's greatest sin is murder, and it's happening all around the world. Genocide is taking place all around the world. The world's sin is killing each other. Stop doing it. But that's not what Jesus said. Jesus didn't say, man, the world's greatest sin is is rape. And man, through sex trafficking, there's boys and girls that are being violated all around the world. That's the greatest sin. Stop doing it. It's not what Jesus says. Jesus said, he'll convict the world of sin. And then he says in that verse, the world's sin is that it refuses to believe. You see, the greatest sin is not murder as horrendous as it is. 
The, the worst sin is not rape and, and violating the young as, as, as awful and as horrific as that is. The worst sin is failing to believe in Jesus Christ. Often I have people ask me interesting questions. Brian, do you think Adolf Hitler is going to be in, in hell? <laughs> You know, and we get all kinds of questions, and then they come back, obviously, why? There's no doubt that he's going to be in hell because somebody who did such atrocities, there's no way that he can be in heaven. And, and, and certainly, my personal opinion, I'm not God, and only God knows. I, I, I can't imagine Adolf Hitler being anywhere else. But uh, if Adolf Hitler's in hell today, he's in hell not because of the atrocities that he committed. He's in hell because he failed to believe in Jesus Christ. And Jesus says the Holy Spirit's job is to convict the world of sin because it fails to believe in me. You see, the Holy Spirit convicts the world of their failure to believe in Jesus Christ. I met with a, a young couple in, in my office this week that came in and and just shared a tremendous testimony of how they'd been raised in, in a different religion, a religion that was kind of tied in with works, and said they began on their own, no religious services, no church, just on their own, began reading the New Testament. And in their own words, they said as they read the New Testament, they came to the realization that salvation was found only in Jesus Christ. And both of them gave their lives to Jesus Christ. Who pointed them in that direction? It was the Holy Spirit of God. Because the Holy Spirit convicts the world of sin. He convicts the world of their failure to believe in Jesus. Notice verse 11. He says this. Judgment will come because the ruler of this world has already been judged. The Holy Spirit convicts the world as to the certainty of future judgment. Here's what he said, judgment will come. And last Sunday, Brad did such a fantastic job teaching the fact that every man, every woman, every child will one day stand before God. It's the Holy Spirit that brings that realization and that conviction to our hearts. You see, here's what Jesus said, the Holy Spirit convicts. Now, now, I want to pause for a second because I want to be really practical. Sometimes as pastors, we're guilty of throwing out words and we walk away saying, okay, the Holy Spirit convicts, but we really don't understand how, what that means. And so you might sit back and say, okay, Brian, what does that look like in your life? What does that look like in my life? What does it mean that, that the Holy Spirit convicts us? How does the Holy Spirit convict? You see, Maybe just like Samuel in the Old Testament, you're hearing him, but you're not recognizing his voice. He's speaking to you, but you're not cognizant of the fact that he is speaking to you. What does it mean to be convicted by the Holy Spirit? Let me give you two things. It's not in your notes. It's extra. Let me give it to you today. The first is this. Conviction begins with the recognition of God's holiness. Conviction begins with the recognition of God's holiness. It was there in Isaiah chapter 6. If you've ever read through the book of Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah begins the, uh, his book talking about Israel and how sinful Israel is. And he, and he says, woe on Israel. Israel, you're going to receive God's judgments. And he, he's talking bad about Israel until we come to the beginning of chapter 6. And in the beginning of chapter 6, Isaiah catches a glimpse of God. In all of his glory, he sees God as he really is. And Isaiah's message changes. It changes not from, woe are you Israel. It changes to, woe am I. Woe am I before God. Why? Isaiah caught a glimpse of a holy, righteous, pure God. And that changed his life. I'm reminded of the words in Genesis chapter 39 and verse 9 where Joseph said this, How could I do this great evil and sin against God? David said in Psalm 51.4, Against you, God, against you alone have I sinned. You see, conviction is a recognition of God's holiness. 
You see, quite frankly, if you're sinning today, if you're doing things that you know don't please God, and yet there's no sense of inner remorse, there's no sense of inner conviction, you do not have an understanding of who God is. Because God is perfectly holy. God is perfectly righteous. Conviction begins with a recognition of God's holiness, and it follows with a recognition of my unholiness. You see, it's a realization that when I compare myself to God, man, I am unholy. You see, we have a tendency, and I'm chasing a rabbit here just a little bit, but but it's a good rabbit, okay? And it's going to taste good at the end, all right? We have a tendency in this day and age to compare ourselves with each other. And, And we're in a church like ours, and we look around a church like ours and we see everybody else and, and as we're not doing it necessarily consciously but, but we're comparing ourselves with everybody else. And I look over and say, man, you know what? I compare myself with, with Mike and I'm a pretty good Christian compared to Mike. Not that Mike isn't a good Christian but, uh, and, uh, and I compare myself to Clint and I compare myself to Stanton and I compare myself to Brian and, and we have a way of looking around, seeing the way everybody else is living and we have a way of making ourselves feel good about ourselves because we compare ourselves with each other. Newsflash, I shouldn't compare myself with you. And you shouldn't compare yourself with me. We should compare ourselves only with God. And when I compare myself with God, I walk away every time realizing that I'm a sinner. Thankfully, I'm a sinner saved by grace, but I'm a sinner and I have not achieved His holiness. See, it's the job of the Holy Spirit to convict me of that. It's the job of the Holy Spirit to convict you of that. The first thing that the Holy Spirit does is he convicts us of sin. Let me pause for a second. What is he convicting you of today? Right now, in the quietness of your heart, what is the Holy Spirit convicting you of today? The Holy Spirit convicts. He does a second thing. The Holy Spirit not only convicts, but the Holy Spirit also indwells. We're here in John chapter 15. Go back to to John chapter 14, verses 16 and 17. John 14, verses 16 and 17, Jesus says, and he says, I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate, same word, who will never leave you. He is the Holy Spirit who leads into all truth. The world cannot receive him because it isn't looking for him and doesn't recognize him. But you know him because, notice this phrase, he lives with you now and later will be in you. That's what Jesus said. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20. Paul says this, Don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to you by God? You do not belong to yourself, for God bought you with a high price, so you must honor God with your body. Here's what Jesus says, and here's what Paul says. Every believer is indwelt by the Holy Spirit. Let me say that again. Every believer is indwelt by the Holy Spirit. Let me say that again. Every believer is indwelt by the Holy Spirit. Would you say that with me today? I want you to catch that truth. Every believer is indwelt by the Holy Spirit. The moment that you realized that you were a sinner. The moment that you trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you were indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God. Here's what Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. I didn't put it up on the screen. Paul says, some of us are Jews, some of us are Gentiles, some of us are slaves, some of us are free, but we have all been baptized into one body, 
by one Spirit, we all share the exact same Spirit. So this morning, it doesn't matter how long you've been a believer. If you've been a believer for two days or you've been a believer for 20 years, you and I possess the exact same Holy Spirit of God. He indwells within each and every one of us. Here are a few practical truths about his indwelling. The first is this. If he does not live in you, then you are not in Christ. If the Holy Spirit does not live in you, then you are not in Christ. Here's what Paul said in Romans chapter 8 and verse 9. Paul says, but you are not controlled by your sinful nature. You are controlled by the Spirit. If you have the Spirit of God living in you, and remember that those who don't have the Spirit of Christ living in them do not belong to Him at all. In other words, if the Holy Spirit of God is not living within you, you are not a believer. If you are a believer, you possess the Holy Spirit of God. If he does not live in you, then you are not in Christ. The second thing I wrote is this. If he does not live in you, then you are all alone. If he does not live in you, then you are alone alone. John 15, 26, we looked at it at the beginning. He says, and I will send you the advocate, the idea. I will send you God's holy presence who will be living in you. It's interesting. Yesterday I was, I was finishing the message and I was exactly on this point when the mail truck went by. And so I'm always like you. I mean, when the mail truck comes by, you got to stop everything you're doing you went, yeah, and you got to go out and get the mail because who knows, you might get you know, a $10,000 check in the mail. And so you got to go out and you got to check the mail right away. So I went out and checked the mail and the only thing that was in the mail were three things. A bill, which I wish I hadn't received, all right, advertisements, and this flyer that said this, I live alone. Now, Now I was just writing this point about being alone and so I stood out there at the mailbox and thought, Oh my word, that's exactly what I'm talking about. And the lady says, I'm, I live alone, but I'm never alone because I have life alert. Now I'm not, doing a, I'm not doing a product sale for life alert. I'm not getting paid to do this at all by any sense of the imagination. All right, but we could cross out life alert. And as a believer, you might say, I live alone, but I'm never alone because I have the Holy Spirit of God living within me. If you are a believer, you are never alone. You see, without the Holy Spirit, an unbeliever faces life's difficulties and challenges all alone. They do not have a comfort or a friend, an advocate that is with them 24-7. But if you're a believer, you're never alone. You may be the only human being living in your house, but you are not alone alone. You might not have any other family members that are alive today, but you are not alone. You might eat lunch today all by yourself, but I assure you of the fact that you are not alone. If you're a believer, the Holy Spirit of God is living within you. Learn to listen to the encouraging voice of the Holy Spirit as he comforts you as he speaks to you. Here's the third thing I wrote down. The third thing is this. If he does not live in you, then you are without direction. If he does not live in you, you are without direction. Galatians 5, 16. So I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. Living without the Holy Spirit is like traveling without a GPS system. It's like cooking without a recipe. A recipe. It's like trying to put together your child's playground without instructions. You're in trouble if you don't have the Holy Spirit of God. The fourth thing I wrote down is this. If he does not live in you, then you will not live in heaven. If he does not live in you, then you will not live in heaven. In heaven. Romans 8 and verse 11, Paul says, The Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. 
And just as God raised Christ Jesus from the dead, He will give life to your mortal bodies by the same Spirit living within you. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. And now you Gentiles have also heard the truth, the good news that God saved you. And when you believed in Christ, he identified you as his own by giving you the Holy Spirit, whom he promised long ago. The Spirit is God's guarantee that he will give us the inheritance that he promised and that he has purchased us to be his own people. You might sit back and sometimes ask the question, How do I know? How do I know that when I die, I'm going to heaven? How do I know? God says, listen, I got that covered. I gave you the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the guarantee. Some versions say he is the down payment of all of your inheritance. Our Spanish translation, if you speak Spanish, says he is las arras. It's a, it's a cool term. You have to understand Spanish culture because whenever uh, couples get married often, especially in Mexico, they did this. The husband gives during the ceremony, he gives these gold coins to his wife. And the gold coins are called arras. And during the ceremony, he gives those gold coins to his wife as a guarantee during that ceremony. This is just the beginning of everything that I'm going to give you. But this is the guarantee that from this day forward, I am taking care of all of your needs. That's the idea that's in this passage. And the Apostle Paul says that the Holy Spirit of God is the guarantee that one day we will live in heaven. He indwells us. He indwells each and every believer. Let me give you a third point today. The third point is this. The Holy Spirit empowers The Holy Spirit empowers. If you have your Bibles, go with me to Ephesians chapter 3. Let me show you a couple of verses as as we wind this up and draw to a close today. Ephesians chapter 3, beginning in verse 16. Notice what Paul says. I pray that from his glorious, unlimited resources, he will empower you with inner strength through his Spirit. Then as Christ makes his home in your hearts as you trust in him, your roots will grow down deep into God's love and keep you strong. And may you have the power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, and how deep his love is. May you experience the love of Christ, though it is too great to understand fully. Then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. Just a couple of points. The first is this. The Holy Spirit provides supernatural power. That's the idea uh, in the passage. Paul is praying to God and he prays that the creator would would, uh, empower the Ephesians with the Holy Spirit who in turn would give them supernatural power. And here's the idea that he says. He says, I wrote it in these words, though our outer man is becoming weaker and weaker. Can I get an amen to that today? Anybody's outer man becoming weaker and weaker? I I, I don't know what it is, but sometimes my mind, in my mind, I'm 25 years old, all right? Sometimes in my body, I feel like I'm 80 years old. There's mornings I wake up and I think, oh my word, I didn't do anything yesterday. I laid around all day yesterday. Why does my body hurt? Though the outer man becomes weaker and weaker, Paul says, the Holy Spirit helps your inner man to become stronger and stronger. Paul says it this way in 1 Corinthians 4, 16, so we do not lose hearts. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. Here's the other thing I wrote. Although life becomes more difficult to understand, and it does, does life become more difficult for you? We see what's going on in our life and we cry out, why, God? We see what's going on in our life and we cry out, how long, God? God, what is going on in my life? Though life becomes more difficult to understand, the Holy Spirit helps us to fully comprehend 
God's love. Paul says that God has given us the Holy Spirit so that we might understand the height and the depth and the breadth of God's love. When we're going through the deepest, darkest moments of our life, when we in our flesh begin to question, does God love me? It's the job of the Holy Spirit of God who lives within you and lives within me to remind me and to remind you of God's great love for us. The Holy Spirit provides supernatural power. The last thing that I wrote in my notes is this. The Holy Spirit completely fills you. Notice verse 19 in chapter 3 once again. May you experience the love of Christ, though it is too great to understand fully. Then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and the power that comes from God. Jump over to chapter 5 and verse 18, a verse that many of us are familiar with. Paul says, don't be drunk with wine because that will ruin your life. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit of God. Please don't misunderstand what I'm saying this morning. It is not that you need more and more and more of the Holy Spirit. The idea is that he needs more of you. To be filled with the Holy Spirit means that we will allow him to occupy and control every aspect of our lives. Let me, let me just illustrate that real simply today as we conclude. Uh, I have two glasses of water, all right? Imagine today that you're in the service and you're not feeling well and you're sitting back saying, man, Brian, you know what I could really use? I could really use a glass of Al- Alka-Seltzer that would make me feel better. And so I say, hey, you know what? I'd love to give that to you. Mike, you need Alka-Seltzer? Here it is, right here, Mike. Here's the Alka-Seltzer. And I put the Alka-Seltzer in, and you can come get it, Mike. I put the Alka-Seltzer in. Now, is that Alka-Seltzer gonna help him right there? Is it, now, all the power is in there, though, is it not? It's in there. Everything he needs to feel better is in there, right? What's the problem? It's still in the package. Haven't opened it. You can take that mic and you can drink that if you want to, okay? You're welcome. All right. Just a a prophetic word there. I'm sure he wasn't feeling good right there. Whereas if you open it up and you put it in, what happens? All of a sudden, it begins to work. And and the power that is inside the package. Now, I can't get it out. It's really difficult. There, There you go. The power that's inside the package begins to work. Listen, I don't know how eloquently I've stated it this morning, but here's what I want you to get. In you, living in you, is the Holy Spirit of God. The same Holy Spirit that in Genesis chapter 1 moved across the waters. The same Holy Spirit that accomplished miraculous deeds throughout the Bible. He is living within you and he's living within me. And Because of our lack of faith, because of our lack of surrender, we fail to open the package and we fail to allow him to work in our lives. So we struggle with the same sin day after day and week after week. We have relationships that don't honor him. Yeah, 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 we blew it. But within us is living the great relationship builder. Within us is living the great sin overcomer. Within us is living the great encourager that helps us to fight discouragement. We have everything we need living within us. And yet we're satisfied with mediocrity. We're satisfied with who we are. And our greatest need The greatest need here at Hollywood Community Church 
is not a new sound system, and God knows how we need a new sound system. The greatest need at Hollywood Community Church is not getting all of our air conditioners working at the same time. The greatest need at Hollywood Community Church is not music or programs or Awana or whatever. The greatest need at Hollywood Community Church is a recognition that we need the Holy Spirit of God. And we're desperate for Him. And we cry out to Him. And we realize that God has given all of Him to us. But we fail to access who He is. My mom, I'm done. My mom just bought a brand new Kindle Fire. My mom's how old my mom? 75 years old. It's tough for my mom to understand technology. She bought this, this apparatus that can do absolutely everything. And all she does is she plays games on it. <laughs> and I'm like, Mom, m- Mom, do you know what that machine can do? No, 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 I'm good. I'm good. I'm playing my games. I'm I'm like, Mom, do you realize that we can Skype with each other? Mom, do you realize that you can access the internet? Mom, do you realize that you can, no, 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 I'm good just playing my games. And it's like, you spent $300 on an elegant game. You don't understand the capabilities that that machine has. That's the same way we are. We have the Holy Spirit of God and we're satisfied with him doing just a little bit in our life. And God, the Holy Spirit is broken. He's grieved, and he's quenched at times because he says, Brian, I have so much more for you. Vicki, I have so much more for you. Mark, I have so much more for you, surrender to me. Don't be drunk with wine. Don't allow anything else to control your life. Be controlled by the Holy Spirit of God. And when you do that, it'll transform your life. It'll change your life. Mm -hmm.